what can you, how can you describe AEDP in your style, in your words, in your work? How do I describe AEDP? Mm -hmm. I would describe AEDP as an attachment oriented, emotion centered, trauma informed healing methodology that is trying to take all the latest science of what, what, what a therapist can do to create positive neuroplasticity and positive transformation, right? With the idea that people transform for the worst all the time with traumatic experiences, but there's not a lot of focusing on how to transform in a moment from a positive experience, from a, a moment of connection with either a therapist that's new and or a moment of connection with yourself or ideally both where something that was bad, what did feel bad has now become something that is digestible and leaves you feeling better, more relieved, more confident. And so it's a, it is, it's a rich modality based in attachment research, motion theory, trauma theory, transformational theory, neuroplasticity, and effective change mechanisms that are like spelled out, like that we can, that you can learn and actually create foster an environment for positive change. Thank you. You see, I love your simplistic way of bringing together <laughs> so much information. It's beautiful. Thank you. So you mentioned it's like a healing um, based therapy. So how would you say this differs from other forms of trauma therapy? And I'll tell you what keeps coming to mind. And it could be that this is coming from a place of, you know, I haven't gone and done a ton of research and, and exploration in this, but there's, it seems to me with the AADP that there's a tremendous um, the place from where much of the work is born is from the experiential mm -hmm. um, components of it. And so how does that differ from other forms of trauma therapy that, that are veering in that direction and specifically like the somatic healing? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, for me, and I think if you ask AEDP therapists, you'd probably get different, um, different answers, just like on the website, because it's hard to define, you've got different um, kind of masters in the technique defining what they think AADP is. Yeah. Um, but for me, what there are many good trauma experiential modalities like somatic experiencing and sensory motor processing and EMDR and um, and then offshoots of ADP like ISTDP. Those are the short-term dynamic psychotherapies and affect phobia therapy. Um, they, they use the triangle and whatnot. The difference is that there's a heavy emphasis in AEDP on this kind of stance of the, of the therapist. And in this stance of creating secure and safety, secure attachment and safety, you can fit in as an umbrella any modality and weave it in, which is, which is quite nice. The kind of signatures of AEDP and how they, there's a kind of a few key differences that Diana Fosha would highlight. One is a preferencing of the positive, of positive affect and helping a person build what we say in the jargon as effective receptive capacity, meaning we are shining a light on, on relationship and what is good and are you taking in this moment of of connection, whatever, whenever it sort of pops up in the therapy, we will, we will notice it out loud and ask a person to actually experience what it's like, for example, to feel connected. So spontaneously, a, a patient or client might say, um, if we check in, you know, how is this, what's it like for you right now that you just had this emotional uh, experience of something that's new? well, I feel calm and I just feel very connected with you, you know, I, and so the next question might be, wow, what's, what's that actually like? How do you know you're connected in this moment? What's it feel like in your body? And then, well, I might feel some warmth. I might feel kind of expansiveness. And then the therapist might self-disclose what that's like to hear, which 
amplifies and deepens it if the patient allows that. What's that like to share with me this warmth? What's it like to hear that I feel this warmth too? What's that like inside? And these kind of, we call them spirals of transformational processes that deepen and unfold in real time and are just ever ways, deepening ways to know oneself. And at the same time, it's creating a space, like a new marker for these type of experiences so that they can be referred to next time in the therapy session and also referred to there's a building awareness that the patient can take out into the world, into their own relationships and say, you know, do I have this? Do I, and if I don't, do I want this? And how can I cultivate this in my relationships? So that's just one example, preferencing the positive, as we call it. The other main kind of um, method difference in AEDP is this thing that we do called meta-processing, which I just gave an example of, which is it's not enough just to have an experience. We want to process what it's like to be aware of having this experience to make, again, another buzz line in AEDP is we make the implicit explicit. So um, how was it that we were able to actually process this deep sadness that you've been holding for decades? Uh, how did that feel that we processed this together and you felt calmer at the end? And I know the person felt calmer because I've asked all the way through and then I feel calm. Well, what's it like that we just did this work together? And not some training therapists, and I think me in the beginning too, I was like, well, isn't that kind of like, are we asking for like positive feedback? You know, people get confused with kind of a narcissism in the therapist. And it's, no, I'm very clear. This is not to like, tell me I did a good job. It's like, really, what was it like to do this together? Was it good? Was it scary? Um, was it, again, does it build expansive energy? Does it make you feel vulnerable? Like you said, too much. Like what was the actual experience? And we call it meta-processing. So it's, you know, the meta of the processing, like one step removed. I so, yeah. It's so nice. So you have like the positive privilege, as you mentioned, and then you have the meta-processing. And mm -hmm. in the positive, uh, uh, privileging the positive, you made a re very strong reference to this component, this tremendous component of ADP, which I, I don't know that I've seen this so direct elsewhere, mm -hmm. the relational component of the therapy. Right. And, and that's actually a huge question that I, that I kept on having as I listened to Diana's, um, you know, intro, like her course. Mm -hmm. And as I read the book and as everything I looked at on the website, and I, I wonder how this works. Like, considering that strong emphasis on the relational component of the therapeutic alliance, how do you safeguard, like ensure that you're not creating for the client um, uh, dependency. Uh, emotional dependency and yeah. while simultaneously promoting their own self resiliency, reliance, emotional reliance, yeah, it's such an important question, Leah, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that because it's definitely, it, it's in my mind. And again, I can only speak for myself because I think that different um, faculty members and, and supervisors and just people that will speak about ADP might have uh, a different takeaway, but hopefully not too different. Um, so I think, and I also think this is where my psychoanalytic training kind of helped me a little bit too, but I, I'll give you one, I just want to validate, yes, that the goal is not to create emotional dependency, but there is a phase in development. So if you think of people coming in with, with young parts of them that have been wounded and that didn't get enough of something, they, they may go through a phase, right? You, of, of what it feels like to rely on someone, especially when you couldn't rely on someone. But the but there are techniques, I mean, there, it's sort of a two, I'll just think of the way I do it. One is the, the frame and the boundaries I have are, are in my mind. And so I try not to, unless somebody is in crisis where I may be connecting with them in between sessions um, more, 
more casually a patient that I've known for many years, for example, we might have a text in the beginning of the, you know, in the middle of the week between two sessions. Um, I typically don't do those type of things because I want it to feel very boundaried in the session and, and that there's a frame there that doesn't leak onto other relationships and get confused. That's one way. The other is in the sessions when we're working with younger parts, um, depending on how, let's say someone is not, didn't experience too much an emotional neglect and they have a core, more of a core sense of self, I'm trying to help their present day adult confident part work with in inner child parts themselves. So they, I'm, I am fostering and teaching them to be their own loving parent if they didn't have one or to add to that loving parentness to their own child parts. So it's an interior connection and I'm going to foster that as opposed to me taking care of them, me sort of falling into any type of codependency and really always trying to lead and bolster their most capable, their most, um, um, uh, what, are, what would be the word? The, the solid parts of them that can care for themselves. Now, sometimes people were so neglected that you first have to show by example, it's almost as you allow them to depend on you to safely connect and to really kind of surrender to that. And as that kind of core sense of self, again, this kind of happens simultaneously, you're also, you're building that up to care for younger parts again, because that's really where the dependencies come. So in the beginning, I might, I might offer soothing to, um, to a young part because the client or patient does just has no idea what that feels like or what there's no model in their mind. And then I might say, can you come join me? There's a lot of fantasy work. That's, that's why when I'm describing things, we're, we're in deep, very vivid, explicit fantasies. Can you, can we all hold this baby together? So always trying to bring in, it's never where the adult patient is on the side and I am, I am just having an attachment to their pain. It's, it's this idea that they are going to be responsible because there's, and the rationale for that is that there is no, you know, when we're young, we expect and we should expect a parent or caregiver to be unconditionally there for us and to take care of our suffering the best that they can. But as a, in adult relationships, we can't expect, expect our adult partners to take care of our child parts because those needs just go far beyond their child's needs, which are um, huge. And so we can have our adult partners be there for us in many ways, but the, for the really wounded parts, it has to be uh, an, uh, kind of a joint effort of taking care of oneself. You can't kind of forego that responsibility. And, and that's the way that I see, I guess, developmentally moving through a dependency phase into a gentle kind of re rapprochement where the getting more independence and then ultimately um, into an adult that is self-sufficient and can have an adult relationship and still take care of their wounded parts even as the volume you know hopefully has turned down on that does that make sense i think so and i think that what i'm hearing from you um a lot is really the the basis on what you built this whole response on is starting with that premises of that very strong boundary relationship that you're really keeping your style of therapy contained to the sessions and that you're not having the outside of um session like you said only in a very rare occasion when you would check up on a client outside of the session or something because this way you're i guess ensuring that 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 experience that emotional mm -hmm. experience of that younger part having that soothing um, doesn't spill into when they're living their life outside of the therapy room. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And we are trying to contain that anyway. So it's just, again, right. a, a model for, for how to do that. Exactly. Right. So in, yeah. in, it's true that in typical therapy, you're trying to contain that regardless. Um, it's almost sounding like to me, and I'm not sure if it's just the way I'm hearing it, 
that there's an extra caution, so to speak, of why you would want to really ensure that in this kind of model, because you're showing up, you're putting such a strong emphasis on the, what's it like with me? You know, the yes. with me, underlining and highlighting the me, which is relationship with me as your therapist, as opposed to being in therapy, you know? Yes, and exactly. That's so deep. I think that's like, it's really powerful and it's really deep. And, you know, I, when, I, when I read it and when I saw it and when I heard Diana talking about it, to me, it's almost like, wait, how do you do this in Safeguard? And I can hear how that boundary, um, keep it to the therapy room model works to support that. I still wonder though, how do you, like then how do the clients transition out of therapy? Like, because then th this becomes a safe place where they get to experience that and they, and it becomes very defined that that doesn't spread into other parts of their life outside mm -hmm. of the therapy room. But then when they're so wounded, like you, you know, spoke about, and, and, you know, I, I think of what comes to mind for me, like you talk a lot about Sarah and Fran and, you know, in your book and, so then how do they come to a place of transitioning out of it, which I think the second half of your answer really answers to that, that that's a lot of the work that you're trying to do in the therapeutic process of helping them learn how to become their own, um, you know, that, that soothing component, you know, how to be able to serve themselves in that soothing way. Exactly. And basically, again, to go back to jargon, we're teaching them how to regulate. Right. Uh, and we are not only teaching intellectually through the information, we are, the brain is changing and they're becoming more regulated. So that it just, with the, with the boundary and, the, and the, 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 the intense connection, those two things, which is really what, what good parenting is, right? That there's right. a boundary between the self and other. You are your own person and I am here to help. I'm not going to tell you what to do and I'm just going to help you blossom into your own person. And then, you know, when you're upset and when there are parts of you that are getting in the way that are younger or regressed, whatever you want to call them, that we are going to help those parts and to help you feel better so that you can go out in the world and do what you want to do as an adult now. Yeah. And I thank you for explaining this one, because I'm telling you, that was to me like just kept flashing in my mind that I'm like, I got to ask somebody that's doing this modality um, and practicing it, you know, where that, how that, where that starts and ends. And yeah. I really appreciate that response. Yeah. Should I add one thing in that there is, you know, the art of this is, and the practice is the nuance in that everybody is, is different and everybody thrives on a different level of connection. So you don't, you really, that's the whole kind of big thing in AADP is the attunement. So, you know, there are people that are sort of naturally don't want as much connection than others. And so you don't, force that you're really doing a dance and letting the patient lead and really honoring who they are and what they need. That's one thing. The other thing is this idea of boundaries is so crucial. I've heard from more than one person that it was my, my sense of boundaries that allowed them to be so connected, that they didn't get frightened of being swallowed up by my needs because it's, it's not my needs. Um, I think, you know, with all therapies, uh, you know, that there is, you want to find a therapist that has good boundaries. I would say that. Yeah. And really important for the therapists work on their own, you know, become clear what is their stuff and what is the patient's stuff and um, to do their best to keep that very distinguished. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. So my next question for you. So using the concept of fantasy, right, to complete like these stuck emotions, and a lot of times this comes up in your book, um, specifically with like anger, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious, how do you, you know, you mentioned this dance of the therapist, you know, you're constantly, moment, you know, um, tracking with each individual mm -hmm. patient. How do you assess like, who is a safe patient, so to speak, to go there? Because mm -hmm. my thought is, and I know that this is not specifically only to AEDP work, this is going anywhere, you know, IFS probably would apply this as well, but um, some, you know, for some people, I imagine 
being able to have the opportunity to go into that zone of enacting in their mind on their fantasy, um, certainly in ways that could be, you know, coming from sourced from anger, then would that reinforce, like, how does that work that it won't, that, like, how do we control that, that it doesn't reinforce going and then carrying something out similar or on a lower scale in their actual life? Yeah, um, Leah, they're fantastic. It's such an important question. And um, what's, what's so interesting, I really like helping people with anger, that it's counterintuitive. But, and, and there's a couple of things. If somebody came to me for anger management and anger issues, and there's a, a background of any type of acting out that... Um, I would be cautious. And in fact, when people hesitate, um, you know, I will lead a person in, you know, they'll tell me they're angry and then I'll kind of lead them into, uh, how do you know you're angry? How do you feel that in your body? I feel this energy coming up and a burning and a tension in my jaw. And if this energy could come up and out at, um, for example, your mother, you know, whoever the person is talking about, your boss, what would it do? And then I get like a, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> what are you asking me to do? I, I'm not a violent person. And of course, I never said anything about violence. So already I know that the unconscious is coming up. I'll say, okay, let's pause because never push. We're going to stop here. What's the concern? Oh, I, you know, I would never hurt anybody. Okay. No, I know. Um, do you, you know, you understand this is fantasy, not a dress rehearsal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little bit of magical thinking, I might say, kind of facetiously, like, you know that your mother's fine. She'll never know. This is just between us. And the other thing that I'll, that I'll sometimes ask is, have you, if they say they're worried about losing control, I was like, have you ever lost control in your life and, and hit somebody or, or punched a wall or, or really lost it? And if they say no, then I pretty much, that's a green light. It's, it's not going to happen. If they say yes, then I will get some more information, what happened around that. And what actually ends up, what I hold on to in the confidence in my mind, and I can't remember who told me this, who taught me this a while ago, but the violence really is a product of not being able to um, use fantasy. That the people who go out and commit heinous crimes have an impulse and they act on it. And it's actually in the use of play, and this happens again with children, that anger can become channeled into safe ways of expressing it. Like for children where you, you, know, you might say, well, you can't hit your sister because we don't hit people, but we can take this doll and we can pretend it's your sister and you can just beat the crap out of this doll. And it's fun and playful and releasing. And that's something I would help parents to really allow for their kids, as opposed to the parent being so frightened of, you know, that a lot of times parents struggle with anger and emotions and, and we'd have to do some work with them. So um, I would just go gingerly. I would ask what's the worst thing that they imagine if they were to, re in fantasy, you know, imagine what they want to do. And once they think of what the worst thing that could happen, it kind of, fizzles out. It's like, there is nothing bad because it's playing. But again, um, there's a the shame that can come up between us. They don't really know what I'm asking. And I explain it. I often share my own experience doing rage portrayals in my own therapist's office, just trying to normalize everything and, and just how um, it can be sort of, dare I say, fun. You know, I wouldn't make light of it if somebody experienced tr tremendous abuse and we were doing something to their perpetrator. But you know, as time goes on, it, things do loosen up and there can be a great sort of relief in being able to safely release anger so that, you know, I feel better and nobody got hurt. I meaning the patient. Yeah. And, and thank you. First of all, what a beautiful thought on the um, acting out is really like that limitation of the being able to, to engage in the fantasy and the yeah. play. And, and I, what a, it, what a beautiful thought. It's really, it's a lot to think about and to process. And um, I think there's a lot of depth in there. And I, and I imagine specifically with AEDP and the meta-processing co component, 
the closure that's created post that fantasy experience yes. um, is incredibly, probably almost in addition to healing, securing. Yes. In terms of walking them now away from the fantasy back into where do we want to place this? Because, yes. you know, the acting out, if they just walk out a session after they just went and killed their father, you know? <laughs> Yep. Or, you know, something like that, then, um, you know, that, that, you know, I, I, I can't speak for other modalities of therapy that would go into this, that would use this fantasy in this kind of way, just because I haven't studied them well enough to be able to comment. But I imagine that that metaprocessing component is just so secure to bring them back from that, bring them down. Absolutely. And not only that, there's a step before, like, I wouldn't, um, unless I had enough time to go through the full wave of a core emotion, I wouldn't do it. Or unless I sort of had a feeling that we could stop someplace safely. That, but the the ideally, the anger crescendos right as they're as they're imagining the fantasy. Then during in the sort of in the middle phase, the crescendo, like if you think of a belt, like of a wave, the top of the curve. Okay you know, what are you, what are you doing now? Okay. Um, I'm punching the object of my rage, um, person, you know, Mary. Okay. And just imagine it, let it, let all that anger up and out, just let it come out all over Mary until it feels done and make it vivid, right? Imagine what you feel your face on your hand, her face on your fist, really make it vivid, let it all come out. And then let me know what's going on. So I want them to go into their own space. They might say, okay, I'm, I'm done. And then I may have the person look, at, you know, what do you see now? She's on the floor, she's looking scared, she's begging for mercy. Okay, now what's that feel like inside? And so we're going to go back from the experience to checking back in until the charge of that anger is all gone and we're we're at calm or we, it's shifted into, sometimes it shifts into sadness, right? Mourning that this, is, that this person created so much rage in me that I've carried my lifetime that's hurt my relationships. And so there's mourning for the self. Um, we go through that next emotion and then we go through whatever else comes up until the person is really calm. And that's what happens. It's like the charge, it's, it's finite. And it ends, and then we would met a process where I would now bring in the left brain because if you're in an experience, it's very hard to know what's going on. Yeah. So I'll say, you know, I'm just going to share what I just saw because I want you to be able to know what you just did in a very proud way, where you came in feeling all this rage, your anxiety level was high. We you enacted this fantasy. You felt calmer at the end, you felt softer at the end, you felt loving at the end, whatever happened, and, um, and your body calmed down. Is that what you, is that, does that resonate? Is that, you know, change it so that, change my words so that they adequately reflect your experience and they'll either add something or say, no, that's it. And then, wow, what was it like that you could that you could do this, right? That we could do this together. So depending on the person that you could do this or that we could do this together. And what's it like that you feel better after allowing this anger to come up and out so that they really know this, this cause this is a tool that you can use out in life. And it comes in handy so much that you can like, you know, especially in attachment relationships with like partners where you're just so mad, but you don't wanna, um, you know, my goal always is to try to to maintain kind of calm and kindness, even in the face of disagreements and conflicts, and even when I'm upset. And it really helps to be able to think, gee, I'd really like to knock his block off right now, and even kind of maybe imagine taking a hammer and just like <laughs> bouncing it off, you know, my husband's head. And at <laughs> the same time, you know, sort of being like, okay, here we are again, and you know, let's figure this out. So having being able to have that dual experience of being with anger without judging myself because the, the biggest obstacles that people shame and guilt start to come up. And also people don't realize that you can feel grateful, like especially with parents on my blog, I just published a couple of days ago on anger 
with detailed, ver um, more verbatim transcript of somebody trying to um, process anger at their parents, but the parents were also good. They gave them a lot and there was a lot of gratitude and saying, you know, you can feel both rageful and grateful at the same time. We just can't work with them at the same time. So we have to ask the gratitude to move over. Or we could ask the anger to move over and be with gratitude and deepen that. It doesn't really matter. Right. It's sort of whatever front and center. Let's be with that. Thank sort you. And I hear the, sorry, go. No, just to, you, so you really ask the patient, you trust the patient's wisdom, deep kind of unconscious wisdom that whatever is there needs to be there and it's coming for help. Yeah. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I, and I hear and when you were talking about that first component of like, um, you know, really helping to charge, mm -hmm. de-escalate before you even move into the meta processing. And when you were speaking of that, I, I, I think this is the AEDP like coming up that, that I, I'm hearing the constant, in addition to helping the charge settle, there's this constant reflection in the process, right? Where you're, mm -hmm. as that charge is coming down, where you're mm -hmm. checking with them, what was that like to to do that or to have that or to see that or to experience that and that it compounds the charge coming down because not only are they releasing that energy and now the charge is zoning is um sloping downward they're all, you're also shifting the focus making it more purposeful like it's not only a charge coming down so an energy is released it's now taking that energy and bringing it into the reflective state which makes it a, a, a purposeful energy like while they're taking the charge, they're also walking away with reflection. Yeah, no, you're saying something that is or absolutely- releasing the charge. Right, worthy of mentioning. There's never an out of control experience here that's happening. The, the patient never feels out of control. I don't ever feel it's out of control. And if it does, we stop. Like if anxiety skyrockets and a panic attack or something, you know, try not to get to that point, but we would stop. If anything feels unsafe and feeling out of control feels unsafe. So it's really, there's a dual attention. There's, we are here right now together on your behalf with this, with this anger that is not you. It's this anger, this primitive program that we're really trying to do something here for you. It's not about attacking somebody. It's about releasing the anger. And so it's a mindful, it's a mindfulness, but it's a very pointed mindfulness. So I, I often have been referring to the change triangle as like mindfulness with a map. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're exactly right. And that awareness does so much. It one keeps it safe and it's integrating left and right brain. It's precisely what's creating integration and um, regulating the person that we want to make sure there's always an emphasis on the noticing, which is the sort of the, the a, a scalpel is to a surgeon, noticing is to an AEDP therapist. That's where the bringing the attention to exactly what we want to change. Right. Attention that starts, I, I think I read a research article that the attention itself, there's research that it's kind of starts things just moving. It starts like the way I imagine it is like neurons vibrating so that they're ready to like reorganize and integrate for the better. Yeah. yeah. Such a great concept. And, and the other thought that came up as you mentioned this answer was, um, as you responded, I should say, to this question, it was, you know, it's a response. But um, when you were talking about that, that, that idea of the um, fantasy is a way of safely enacting out, you know, those emotions as opposed to carrying them out in, in some dangerous way um, mm -hmm. or unhealthy way, you, what came to mind in the way you were in the, in the language that you were using around it was, I wonder what your thoughts would be around, you know, children doing aggressive video games and things mm -hmm. like that. So when we talk about play, so there's imaginative play, and then there's imaginative play in terms of like a pre-spelled out, so to speak, like what you have in the video game. So that's mm -hmm. not complete imagination because they're not designing that. They're just engaging in some violent game or something, but there's imagination being used in that. Yeah. You want my opinion on that? I'm curious, your thoughts on that. I mean, I am no expert in this whatsoever, but it, it, it's, it seems to be the potential to be missing a reflective component. You can really like immerse yourself in a fantasy. I think that's what happens when people commit violent acts. They are in
Oopsie. Can you hear me? Now I hear you. When people yeah. are committing violent acts, they are immersed. Yeah, they're 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 immersed in some fantasy of like somebody who has done something wrong to them that they are now either a vigilante or protecting or defending themselves, right? So it's like that blur between fantasy and reality, I think, is what happens when people commit violent crimes. Because if you can, if someone commits a violent crime to a stranger, there's a there the stranger is being projected on the transference of the of right. the person. Right, like a, like right. a woman being raped is not about that woman. That woman didn't hurt that guy. So there's a fantasy that's being projected and there's no awareness. So that's what I would worry about in, in video games is for people that are primed already, that don't have self-reflective capacity, that grew up with abuse and neglect um, and that are already don't have that, that it, it could be more confused with um, with just kind of ramping up that like type yeah. thing, as opposed to uh, reading or um, or playing with dolls with a parent who can put it in a context, I guess, and share it. I don't yeah. know. Those are just some thoughts. And and I'm so happy I asked you this question because like, I know I was jumping way out of what we're here to talk about, yeah. but it's a thought that came to mind, and I think that it really. Um, emphasizes the, the response that you had in general about the whole thing of how we keep this safe. Because that distinction of the fantasy play in aggressive violent video gaming, um, as opposed to the fantasy um, engagement in a therapeutic safe, reflective yeah. with a healthy attachment, so to yeah. speak, figure with you, yeah. the, the, the reframing, all those things is really the response that speaks to how do we make this, how do we ensure this is a safe experience? Exactly. Right. And, and, you know, again, the word empathy came up now because as, as when I'm with a patient and we're working on um, and they're releasing anger, there is an, a, an attention to, wow, now that you've punched this person in the face, what do you see in their eyes? So you're also fostering. It's not just about the person. It's about the impact of what they've done. You really want them to feel that impact and then have a response, whether it's guilt or sadness right, or more anger whatever it is, it's okay, we work with it. But in video games, you don't have somebody there, like a parent saying, wow, how do you think all those people feel being gunned down? How do you think right. the parents feel? <laughs> we just, you, you just feel like strong, yay, I killed all the people. <laughs> exactly, and that's what's dangerous because that strong, powerful feeling might be an antidote to a lot of shame and, and sadness and fear and bad feelings. Again, I think yeah. of everything a trauma lens of how a kid is raised and then why a kid takes to video games that are violent like that. So it really depends on on the kid and their level of trauma or adversity. And and if it's amping up their their aggression, which right. is you think of aggression as an acting out, even a defense against the experience of anger to the original perpetrator. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well Hillary, it's been amazing. I'm so glad I've, I, I pushed for the hour. Yeah, yeah, that's great. This was so informative and I've learned so much. I'm delighted to be able to take this and with your permission, of course, share with my professor because yeah. I'm just so excited I had this opportunity. It's, I, I, I really appreciate your work and we didn't even spend that much time talking about the change triangle, right. which I think, which is so powerful and, and I cannot close this without just saying you've taken such a rich depth of information and material and brought it into such a practical tool and you use the language map in mm -hmm. just right now in our conversation and I know you referenced that in the book and when I had to submit papers for this course that I was taking designed around your work you know that is one of like one of the questions that I had to respond to a discussion question or something was something, um, you know, it's something about like the change triangle, how we could use it or whatever. And, and the, the language just popped right in my head, an emotional map to guide us to where we need to go. And you, you brought that to the public yeah. in such a beautiful way. It's such a gift. I'm, I'm so honored that I had the opportunity to speak with you about it. Oh, thank so. you so much, Leah. Yeah. We, we owe a whole separate conversation to the change triangle. Yeah. But we learned so much here. So it's great. Yeah, that's so great. And 
<clears throat> and again, you know, I, I didn't invent anything new. I just saw this piece of ADP and I just thought this piece would be a, a real public health tool that's like, there's just no emotion education in the culture. So that, um, and it helped me so much in my own mental health and in my own relationships, really from the moment I saw it, as you know, from reading the book, you know everything about me. So <laughs> I'm just so, I'm so, I'm so honored and so humbled and so just delighted that, um, that it spoke to you the way that it, it spoke to me.